Our first speaker today and to start the conference is uh, a man that, who was ordained in the 1960s and he became bishop in 1990. Uh, he works in one of the, there was five auxiliary bishops in Dublin and now there are three so he's getting a bigger workload as the years go on. He works in, uh, his area is in the, up in the Tala Deanery and Tala is one of the highest, uh, highest number of unemployed people in the country and it's an area of great, it's great deprivation and he ministers there. He's a trained barrister by one of his many talents. Uh, he worked in many different ministries throughout the diocese over his, uh, since his ordination. And he's a man of great uh, compassion and uh, humility. He, every, there's come, comes a time in everybody's life where they're asked to do something that really is ultra demanding and sometimes uh, we're asked to do jobs that we don't particularly want to do, but this man very courageously uh, was, he very courageously took up the appointment to, to go and help out and sort out some issues down in the Ferns Diocese, and it's a job that demanded great diplomacy, great compassion, great, all of the great mercy and a very delicate, delicate job to be done. But he did it with great distinction and, and I'd say at a great cost to himself. And for that he earned the respect of every person in this country for his great honesty and integrity and truth. So please put your hands together for Bishop Eamon Walsh. Thank you very much. I don't believe half of it. Uh, it's a great joy and it's an honour for me, a privilege to be able to share a few thoughts with you at this very important conference where you gather every year. Um, I hope what I have to say is if there's one little thought that strikes everybody, then I'll, I'll go home happy because my prayer is that the, the Holy Spirit who dwells within each one of us, that in some way the spirit within me and the spirit within you may fuse and in, in, in some way be an instrument of God's love and, and mercy. And what I have to, to, to say is, it's very simple, I could say it in a sentence, that we're loved unconditionally by God, we, each one of us, are temples of the Holy Spirit. And no matter who we are or what we do, we are special in the eyes of God. And God's mercy knows no bounds, no matter what anybody does. And once we pray God's word, then God's love and mercy will get into the way we think and into the way we reach out to one another. And the proof of divine mercy will be seen in the way we treat one another. And that's what is the summary of Matthew 25. So if I could begin with just a reflection on the unconditional love that God has for each one of us. There's a, a Russian author called Tolstoy and he tells in one of his short stories, he talks about a king. The king calls in the religious leaders and the priests, and he says, tell me about your God. But they didn't do very well. And then this shepherd came forward, and he said, I'll tell you. So he looks at him and he said, well, okay, tell me. He said, well, before I tell you, you must put on my clothes, and I will put on yours. So the king reluctantly put on the well, he kind of earthy and 
animal smelling clothes of the shepherd and uh, the shepherd put on those beautifully perfumed silken garments and as the king felt the uncomfortable hair against his precious skin he listened to the shepherd and the shepherd said my god did just that he came on earth and he put on our clothes and when he was going he gave us his and I thought it put it very well, that God took on the human condition. He didn't flinch at any pain, any insult. He had great human courage and love and compassion. And in the end, they, thank you. In the end, they, um, he was going. He said, now I give you the power through the Holy Spirit to let my love flow through you. It's a very simple illustration but it's at one that rings true to me. Now, each one of us is the temple of the Holy Spirit, and that holds no matter what we do. And sometimes that, that gift can be abused in terrible ways by us, the baptized. And if we're involved in any criminal activity, then we are abusing the Holy Spirit that is within us. But God attaches no strings are no conditions to his living within us. It's an extraordinary gratuitous gift that is given to all who wish to share in it. And that's the first point I'd like to make, that it's the spirit is within everybody. And there are many gospel illustrations of this, and probably the best known and best loved is that of the prodigal son. And there is... Uh, an Eastern biblical scholar, a fellow called Ken Bailey, who put the prodigal son in the eyes of the people of the time. And I just like to speak about it in the way that he does. He says, you know, and we'd understand in Ireland how precious the land is. People will fight over who owns the ditch and who owns the gravel in the stream and the rights away, but the land we just lose all reason when it comes to land. And it wasn't much different in, in Palestine in those days. And in the prodigal son, when the son comes and he says to the father, I want half my inheritance and I want it now. What really happened? The farm had been in the family for years, generations, pride in it. So how do you realize half your assets? So you most likely had to sell half the farm and sell it in a hurry and sell it at a bad price and maybe sell it to a neighbor who always had an avaricious look for his land. And then he had to watch the sun go away, knowing that he wasn't going to do much good. And he had to listen to the the gossiping of the neighbors as stories came back about the young lad's exploits. And then the greatest indignity of all for a Jew was to have to tend pigs on a farm. And then it gives that lovely image of the father is, he's always kind of looking down the road to see will he come around the corner. And in those days, landowners and noblemen were very dignified and they never ran and they certainly were careful about the way they, they walked. And he puts it this way, he imagines, he sees the sun, and what does he do? He picks up his garment, doesn't care what the squinting windows are saying or doing, and he runs down the lane, down the street, down to meet the sun, and embraces him, and he is overjoyed, because he that was lost is found, and he has come back. And that's the unbounded love that God has for everybody, no matter what we do. Sometimes people find that hard to do. They want to confine God's love to those who are doing what they want them to do. But the Father's then, his extravagant love, it's, it's contrasted with the resentment of his 
the young, his hard-working other son, who followed all the rules and did everything what any parent would, would long. And he too must have been consumed with annoyance and anger because half the farm was gone probably, and then this so-called, as he call him, waster comes back and they kill the fatted calf. So he's kind of full of anger and resentment. And I'd like to maybe deal with that in, in tomorrow's talk on, on uh, at 10. But it brings across to me that when we read the scriptures, it's the word of God. And again, I talk about the spirit within the word and the spirit within you and me, when they meet and ignite and spark, they can change our mind, they can change our heart, they can change the way we reach out to people. And I'll give you an illustration of that, that the late Bishop Carl often tells this, told the story before he died about when years ago he was chaplain in Mount Joy. And one of the last people to be executed uh, for murder in Ireland was this man from the Midlands. And he was involved in the horrific murder of his brother. In the end, they carved up the body and buried it all over the place. And he was described in the papers as a monster and kind of language we should never attribute to anybody because it dehumanizes them. But it's easier for people to put them in a box when we do that. So he went to visit him, as was the responsibility of the chaplain. You'd go to the, what they call the condemned cell. It's still there today. It's right beside the sacristy in Mount Joy. And it was a single cell that a person was in 24 hours guard, not to, make sure, not to see that they had everything they wanted, but to make sure that they didn't deprive the state of the opportunity of taking their life. And Bishop Carl would go in and talk to him, but he'd never get a word. And your man was there, and his body language said it all. The head was down, eyes downcast, not a word. And he'd go in the next day, not a word. And he'd talk, but he was talking to the wall. The person present, but no communication. And in desperation, he took out the Bible, and he started to read, and he read the prodigal son. And as he finished reading it, the head moved slightly, and your man said, read it again. So he was delighted. This was really big communication, so he read it again slowly to make it last. And the head came up a little higher, and he said, read it again. And he read it again and again. And then he asked the question. He said, who's that story about? And he said, that story is about you. That's about this love that God has for you, no matter what. And there was a faint smile came into his face, and he said, would you, would you mind reading it again? And he read it again. And then he said when he was going, I said, I'll see you tomorrow. And he said, would you, would you mind leaving that book with me? And he said, yes. So he left the Bible on the page for the prodigal son, and he gave it to him. And the officer, when Father Carl, as he was then, came back the next day, said, um, what did you say to that man yesterday? He's a different man, the head is up, he's smiling, he's talking, and whatever book you gave him, he read it, and he asked, would I leave the light on all night? And he kept reading it. And he experienced through listening to the Word of God that he wasn't the monster, that he wasn't this villain, but he was loved by God, and that if he could repent and make his peace with God, then he could look forward to meeting God face to face and be welcomed home like the prodigal son. And that's the unconditional love that God has for us. And sometimes we only get that insight through prayer, through reflecting on the word of God in a prayerful way. So, on the other hand, we can all be baptized, but the depth of God's love isn't always written on our foreheads. 
because blood sometimes is thicker than baptismal water. And what I mean by that is sometimes baptized people can do terrible things to one another in the name of all sorts of causes. And I was privileged in, in, in 1994 to go with Trokra to Rwanda just after the terrible massacres that took place there. And it was the most horrific thing I'd ever seen. We'd seen it on the television screens. But I was brought to this parish, and it was a parish that had a fantastic church, beautiful pastoral center, quadrangle, school, everything, everything you could dream of. And there on Easter Sunday, people from all tribes worshiped together. And their children made their first communion together and confirmation. And they visited each other's houses and they were a Christian community. And on the 6th of April, just like that, they turned. And the people who sat side by side and who had exchanged the sign of peace, they took machetes to each other. And the Hutus killed all the Tutsis. And Father Joseph, who had celebrated the Mass, was a Tutsi. And he was taken out. And he was stripped. And he was beheaded. And that was the way that this Christian community treated one another. Because their baptismal water, really, it must have been skin deep. And let us not get holier than thou, because our own history is full of that. And the many terrible things that happen in the name of, of religion that are very far from the gospel. So when we hear of atrocities, let us think of the times that we in our country have done exactly that. And then let's go a little bit micro and say, well, when have I treated another fellow Christian in a way that is certainly not gospel greedy. So if I could just say, if we ever, if we ever take our eyes off the dignity of each person as somebody made in the image of God, then it becomes much, much easier for us to treat them as a category and not as some mother's son or some mother's daughter. If we depersonalize anyone, then it's the first step away from being walking in the steps of divine mercy. So that the monster language, whether it's in conversation or in the tabloids, it contributes to the erosion of respect that is owed to everyone, regardless of their deeds. Now, this is a tough love, but it's the kind of love that Stephen had when he forgave those who stoned him. It's the kind of tough love that Jesus had when he forgave those who crucified him and handed him over. It's the kind of tough love that Jesus had when he forgave the penitent thief. So if we depersonalize or put people in a category, then in some way we are not treating them in the way that we have been challenged to. And Christianity is tough love. And we hear on the papers, it's almost like a qualification, as if it doesn't, doesn't matter. When they talk about there's a gangland shooting, and then this, the phrase, they were known to the police, as if that made them less of a person, as if that meant that there wasn't a, a child whose father was dead, or there wasn't a wife or a partner whose, whose companion was gone, or a mother whose son or daughter was killed. They're people. And we can't just have a cozy cartel of, of God's love and only love those who fit into our box. And that's the real challenge of the unconditional love of God and God's understanding and mercy that we're called to have. Um, now, forgiveness is something that the more we experience it, the more likely we are to pass it on. And the more we go and ask for God's mercy, the more merciful we will be to other people. 
And some people say that the more a nation drifts away from the sacrament of penance, the more judgmental they can become and the more intolerant because they have stepped away from their own need of forgiveness. And when we do that, we can become hard and in some way intolerant and unforgiving. And we might think we're great when we say, okay, I'll forgive, but I won't forget. Or I'll bury the hatchet, but I'll mark the spot. And if I could just give a story that you may have heard me say before, but it's, uh, it's, it illustrates the point of forgiveness. You can only give what you have. If we've all heard of the Phoenix Park murders that took place in the middle of the 1800s, and there was this group called the Invincibles, and how they murdered in the park Lord Cavendish and his first secretary, John Burke. And within a week, all of the group were imprisoned because one of them, a fellow called Carey, had squealed or betrayed them. And they were all dotted into different prisons around the country. And one of them, a fellow called Joseph Brady, he was detained in Mount Joy. And as he prepared for his execution, the chaplain went to visit him and um, said, well, we make our peace with God. And he said, I will, but there's one thing I can't do. I can't forgive Carey. You couldn't expect me to forgive him. And he said, well, I should try. How could I forgive him? He sat at table with us. His children played with our children. We shared meals together. We planned together and he turned us in. I couldn't forgive him. And chaplain started saying, well, you know, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those. Yeah, I know that, he said. And how many times should we forgive? He said, well, 70 times seven. I know that. What about Stephen? What about Jesus on the cross? I know that, he said. He betrayed us. No go. So the days move on. And then there's a nun who comes on the scene. And she asks the governor, can I visit Joseph Brady? And she's, he said, is he a relation? He said, no. Do you know him? No. Why do you want to see him? I need to talk to him. So I said, no go. So when the governor came back the next morning and she had sat out all night in the rain and kind of said, this, this lassie is serious. So they sent in word to Brady. I said, there's, a nun out here wants to talk to you. And um, he said, um, he was curious. He said, okay, let her in. So she came in and she said, you're going to meet God and you've no reason to tell me a lie, but I need your advice. And I want the advice of somebody who's close to God. And she said, should I leave the sisterhood because I hate somebody with every breath I take? And he said, I had one, I had one brother and... Um, well, everything I had, he was that to me. And um, ever since he died, I just, I just hate, I hate. And he said, ah, oh, well now, sister, you know, you know the scriptures better than I do. And you know where it says, forgive seven times. And Jesus said, no, 70 times seven. And then he becomes preacher and he says, and forgive us our trespasses. And then he thought he was really great when he remembered Stephen. And he said, I remember Stephen uh, uh, forgave those who stoned him. And she said, I know all of that. But it's different when it comes to yourself. And there was a deadly silence because his role as a preacher had failed miserably, he felt. And then there was a silence and a deeper one. And then she said, I, I forgive you for killing my brother, John Burke. And he didn't know where to look. And he then said nothing for a while, but asked for forgiveness. And later on, he told the chaplain, he said, I want you to tell this story. You're not breaking any confidence, but pass this on. And he said, that woman forgave me something that I had no right to be forgiven for. 
I had no right. I'd killed her brother, the only one she had, the only place she could go, and she had a holiday, and he was gone. But I killed him for no reason. And she forgave me. And he says, now I can forgive Kerry. And the reason I can forgive him is because I experienced forgiveness myself, and I'm now able to give what I have. But you can't give what you haven't got. And if we experience the mercy of God, then it gives us a capacity even to forgive what otherwise might be the unforgivable. So that's very much part of divine mercy. We're loved unconditionally by God. Everybody is precious in the eyes of God. We don't categorize people. And we try to learn forgiveness through experiencing it when we cross the line and are forgiven ourselves. And I'll conclude with the practical part of divine mercy, and that is when we are challenged to reach out and be the hands and the ears and the voice of Christ to one another. That every generation is expected to be more civilized than the one that went before. It doesn't always happen, but we're expected to be because we're given the earth, put in control of it, to pass it on to the next generation in better condition than we received it. And so the way we deal with problems in society should be more civilized generation by generation. And we have got rid of, thank God, the death penalty in Ireland. But there are people who sometimes say, I'll bring it back, hang them high, throw away the key, lock them away, because they are, and then they use the category words. And uh, others in a more enlightened way might say, well, why not make sure that if somebody is in prison, that you put them in the shoes of their victim, and you make them see what damage they have done, and get them to a stage where they can repent genuinely, and maybe set about thinking of ways they can repair. In the old Brehan laws, if a person murdered somebody, they weren't locked away in prison. They were made to work the farm at a distance from the family who were deprived of their bread earner and the children of their father. You couldn't do that today, but the thinking was right. You repaired what you could repair in a possible way. And any kind of imprisonment that does not focus on that, to my mind, is just throwing good money after bad. So maybe if your voice is the one that can be heard in times when there's a debate about penal reform, then you in that way can be, and I can be, the voice of Christ in those circumstances. I'd just like to move on to another illustration of that, and it's um, to do with the whole question of mental health in Ireland. We again have moved on a long way from the days where if somebody had a bit of a nervous breakdown or ran amok, that they were put in an asylum for the rest of their days. And I'm, I can remember when they took down the walls around Grange Gorman, and I'm sure you all can. And people were more enlightened and they said, there's a lot of people who can be treated in a community and don't need to be institutionalized all the time. There are always going to be dangerous prisoners who will have to be confined. There will always be people who, through no fault of their own, have a psychiatric condition and are not safe to roam around. But the vast majority can be treated in a different way. But that demands not just professional people, but it demands professional volunteers in the community to make sure that people are properly cared for. And it's no accident that over a third of our homeless people are people who have come out of the psychiatric hospitals. And it's no accident that over a third of our prisoners are of the same category. And that just points to the fact that we have knocked down the walls, but we have not provided the care that is required. And there's no point in us whinging about the government not throwing money at it 
if a lot of it can be done by us as trained professional volunteers. Because we're all born vulnerable. And if we live long enough, we'll die vulnerable. And we're vulnerable in between at different times of illness, bereavement, unemployment. And we need a shoulder to cry on. We need someone to listen to us. And during the time of the Celtic Tiger, the phrase was talked about as been time poor. Uh, people were too busy to give time to one another. And so um, a kind of philosophy grew up that there is a pill to cure every pain, every ill. And so we threw medication at people at times when what they really needed was companionship and someone to listen to them and to care. And I think that's something that we can extend our divine mercy into, that when a person has the time, that we become a trained volunteer and do it in a way that we can make sure that, and I only illustrate it in the context of the uh, people who have mental illness, it can be anybody who is in pain or in need. And to give the final illustration of that, I have seen people in mental hospitals who have become human rocking chairs. And I have seen people in hospitals who have become, their walk has become a slipper shuffle. And the reason a lot of the time is because of medication instead of people to care for them. And the psychiatric nurses are one of the people I have the greatest respect for, but they work under huge stressful conditions, often under-resourced, and the only safe work environment can be when they are, uh, their, their clients are over-medicated. And I've seen some of those same people when they have come out and they've been put in the community and with supervised medical treatment, with less medication, they cease to be the rocking chair and they cease to be the shuffler and can live a more wholesome life. Now, that can only happen in a time of recession if we give the time ourselves when we have the time and we reach out. And the same applies to the whole um, approach to, to drug rehabilitation. That there is a treatment that people give those who are on heroin called methadone. It's meant to be, meant to be a temporary weaning off a drug so that a person can get their life together. But to wean somebody off means they have to be accompanied by time and plenty of time and people to listen and to encourage. And it's much easier to throw chemicals at them. So we have chemical control. And you end up with people on methadone for life and higher doses. And in the end, it's even more addictive than heroin. And it's more destructive to the vital organs. And in the 90s, there was a fatalistic approach to it where people said, ah, well, they never get better. And anyhow, it keeps crime off the street. They're not on our antennae. They're not in our vision anymore and we leave them there. And that's a kind of a callous policy that uh, is not good. And we can't afford to subscribe to treating people uh, just with chemical control when they need more than anything, people time and rehabilitation. And in that context, I have a minute, I think, left. Um, I met a granny who her son used to give her, give her grandson would give, she'd get his methadone and he'd get three days supply and he didn't trust himself that he might sell it or that he might overdose. So she'd dose it out to him like a child and he'd get it in the morning, get it in the evening, at night time. And then after a while, she went into the chemist shop and she looked for a cough bottle that was the same color as the methadone. And she came up with a cough bottle called Night Nurse. And she started giving him nine units of methadone to one unit of Night Nurse. And she gradually changed the mix until he was for three months on pure Night Nurse. And he never coughed once during that three months. <laughs> but he... No. 
At the end of the three months, she said to him one day, Shay, you don't need that methadone. Oh, he nearly shook on the spot. Of course I do. And then she opened the press and she said, there's all the methadone and there are all the empty bottles of cough bottle. And he said, that was it. And he's a social worker now, treating drug addicts. And So, Granny's wisdom has an awful lot going for it. And I just say, we're loved unconditionally by God, which is great. We're asked to keep that in our mind when we may be threatened to put somebody in an undignified box. We don't let people walk on us, but we don't let their actions bring out of us a expression of they're worthless when we know in our heart that they're not. They're always some mother's son, they're loved by God, some mother's daughter. And then we're asked to read the word of God and pray it in a way that it changes the way we think and the way we reach out to people. And the more we appreciate our forgiveness, the more forgiving we can be of others. And if we do have time in our hands and we reach out to one another, after all, we are our sisters and our brother's keeper. And I just illustrated it in the context of people who have difficulties with drugs or those who have mental illness difficulties. So may God's love and mercy grow strong within us. And thank you for listening to me. Thank you.